Hi, everybody. My name is Greg Katz, and welcome to WeRSE.com's Inside the Trojan Settle, where we tell it like it is. Friends, Inside the Trojan Settle is a game-like panel discussion with WeRSE columnists, staff writers, and editorial board. We first start off with the pregame show, where we introduce our panel members for this edition of Inside the Trojan Settle, and then give you the latest USC Trojans football news. Let's first meet this week's panels. Mark Culkin, WeRSC columnist who writes the Monday Morass, Yay or Nay, and Sunday Takeaways, in addition to regular season football and basketball practice reports. Chris Arledge, former William Jewell College defensive back and team captain, We Are SC columnist who writes the popular column Musings with Arledge and is a graduate of the USC Law School. Kevin Bruce, former all-conference linebacker and team captain for the 1975 USC Trojans, we are SC columnist who writes the defensively and offensively speaking after every USC game. And Greg Cat, that's me, your host and moderator of Inside the Trojans Huddle and a weekly We Are SC columnist who writes the obvious and the not so obvious in IMHO Sunday. Before we kick off this edition of Inside the Trojans Huddle, here's the latest USC football news as of today's Monday taping. On Friday, it was announced on social media that former BYU and Contra Costa JC quarterback Jake Jensen committed to the Trojans. Jensen is six foot two, 210 pounds, pounder, recently committed and signed with New Mexico, also in May, and also has re, uh, previously served a two year LDS mission to Argentina, but he's a Trojan. Jake has three years of eligibility remaining. And the Pac-12 has announced kickoff times the first three weeks of the 2022 season for an early November and for an early November game. Kickoff times for the four announced USC games, all Pacific time zone games, are as follows. Rice, September 3rd in the Coliseum at 3 p.m. on the Pac-12 network. At Stanford, September 10th at 4.30 p.m. on ABC. Fresno State, September 17th at 7.30 p.m. Fox Network. And Colorado, November 11th, a Friday night home game at 6.30 p.m. on FS1. And last Wednesday, linebacker Carson Tabiachi committed to the Trojans. Tabiachi is a 6'1", 221-pound linebacker from Park City, Utah, Park City High School. The former two-way, three-star recruit originally signed with the Utah Utes and successfully participated in Utah's recent spring practice sessions before the freshman decided to transfer to USC. And USC is bringing back the popular Salute to Troy on Saturday evening, June 18th on Cromwell Field. Salute to Troy will introduce the 2022 Trojans as well as coaches, the marching band, song leaders, and traveler. The public will be invited to this all-you-can-eat purvey and ensuing football program. And this programming update, we a new WeRSC.com podcast program began this week. WeRSC.com's recruiting guru, Scott Schrader, is hosting a Monday through Friday show entitled The No Cap uh, Podcast Show, which will include Scott's takes on USC football, recruiting with one-on-one -on -one guests as well. We encourage you to check it out. It's up right now. And finally, friends, we are SC Inside the Trojan Settle. Greatly appreciate your viewer and listenership. And we appreciate and encourage those of you watching on sites like YouTube to click on the red subscriber and like buttons it's greatly appreciated, and it is free. All right, before we open with the first half kickoff, a moment to hope all of you had a reflective and enjoyable Monday Memorial Day. We thank all those of you that gave your lives for our great country and those in memory and those that still do to protect us as we speak. So with that, it's time for the opening kickoff and our first quarter topic panel. The kickoff times for the Trojans' first three games in an early November uh, kickoff time have been announced. Let's break those uh, four kickoffs uh, down, and I want you to tell me your opinion, the pros and cons of each kickoff time. It affects all of us, as well as fans attending the game. All times announced are in the Pacific time zone. So let's start off with each game individually. Rice, September 3rd in the Coliseum at 3.30 p.m. Give me your pros and cons. Our leadoff hitter, as always, Mark Culkin. What's the good? What's the bad, Mark? All right. So, um, pro, uh, you know, 3.30 kickoff. Uh, you know, this is a perfect time, um, almost a perfect time, you know, if you want to tailgate, because it'll, it'll give you the chance to, you know, watch games around the country. Um, con, it's on the Pac-12 network. So, you know, it's going to be, number one, September 3rd, 
Labor Day weekend, it's going to be hotter than Hades. So um, either you, you had a choice, you get to go to the game and be hot, or you're forced to go try and find the Pac-12 network and watch the game. Good luck on that. Uh, another pro, it's on the Pac-12 network. And I'm saying this because new team, there's going to be some growing pains. You know, if USC doesn't look great coming out of the box, uh, there's not going to be a lot of people watching the game, uh, except for the ones at the game. So um, that might work in USC's favor as far as getting uh, some harsh criticism out of the box. Um, other than that, I, I think, you know, you, you hope that USC has covered their, what is it, 34, 35 points spread by halftime. By that time, you know, people are going to be running for the exits anyways. Uh, so I... The pros, you know, it's a it's an early mid afternoon game, which is going to get people home in time to spend time with their families. Okay, uh, just a clarification, my my mistake. It uh, it's a three three p.m. kickoff Pacific Coast time, three p.m. Yeah. So, Chris, uh, what do you see the pros and cons? Um, the cons is that your constant propaganda is having an impact on Mark Holkin, who now is scared of rice. I didn't think I would see the day that he was so worried USC will struggle with Rice, but he keeps getting your newsletter. He keeps hearing how, uh, how the talent is looking up there in Houston. Um, so I, I, I actually like, I actually like that start time three o'clock to three o'clock to five o'clock is perfect. Um, uh, I think, uh, unfortunately I can't be at that game in person. I think I'm actually going to be in England. So I think it's going to start at 11 PM for me. Uh, which is late, but it could be worse. Imagine if we had a 7.30 p.m. start, then I'd be in trouble. So I'm fine with that. And it's not going to be, there's not going to be a lot of criticism, Mark. It's going to be a beat down. Rest easy. Well, I'm sure that Mark uh, feels better after you clarified that. Do you feel better, I Mark? So. Mark, are you, by the way, are you getting my newsletter about rice? Is it yeah, it's, 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 it's getting good use, Greg. Trust me. You know, it's sponsored now by Uncle Ben's Converted Rice. I'm very excited about that uh, partnership. It's kind of my own NIL. Okay, Kevin, uh, tell me uh, pros and cons of a three o'clock kickoff. And let's not centralize uh, on rice yet. We'll build them up as the weeks go. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> you know i have found whenever kevin gets overly excited about a question he really wants to kind of formulate it out so kevin take your time and go ahead and tell us how you feel about it yeah so uh, it's good to know it's on pac-12 network and there won't be anybody watching the pac-12 network uh, outside or inside the state of california so we don't have to worry about you know whether we beat the spread against rice which apparently is at risk right now <laughs> um, so that's, uh, I guess that's kind of half good news. Uh, look, a, a late afternoon kickoff is actually a really good player kickoff time. And uh, there'll be a little bit of sun uh, in the eyes for uh, in certain directions, you know, for about an hour, hour and a half, maybe something like that. Unless it's raining, then, you know, all you know, bets are off. It's not going to rain. It September never rains in LA, LA, California. Yeah. We know that, right? Not in yeah. September. Uh, not not yeah. that weekend. Okay. Well, likely uh, that would be uh, bet the over on that. And I, I would agree. Uh, Kevin, let so, me ask you a question. Uh, mm -hmm. As a player, as a player, mm -hmm. does a three o'clock uh, September game affect you in any way uh, by that time start or the time of day, the heat, what, what have you? No, it's good. Actually, I prefer, I prefer night games. Uh, so if it's a three o'clock, it's going to be dark, uh, you know, in an hour and a half uh, or darkish, right? The lights will be up and um, uh, maybe a couple hours, I don't know, somewhere, somewhere around then. So I like that. I preferred that. that I didn't like the noon start time. I, actually, I just liked it intensely, the 12, 12.30 start time as a player. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to uh, just uh, quickly say uh, for all the reasons that all of you have mentioned, uh, I also look at it from a standpoint of a media person because I know what time the game is going to start. It'll probably end around 645. And that's when we start to get to work. So the question is, is what time will I be leaving the Coliseum uh, depending on whatever is happening, the interviews and so on and so forth. So I say, what time will I actually get home? It could be around midnight. Uh, so a lot of these start times, I strictly look at it, uh, both from a fan standpoint and a media standpoint. All right, let's jump to Stanford. 
Uh, September 10th at 4.30 p.m., uh, nationally televised. Give me the pros and cons. Uh, Mark, uh, what do you think about a 4.30 start in Palo Alto? Perfect. I mean, that for me, that's ideal. Um, and again, I'm, I'm coming at it from, you know, more of a fan perspective. You know, before the game, you know, I like to tailgate. I like to enjoy the atmosphere. Um, unfortunately, though, you know, it's it's at the farm. So there's not a whole lot of tailgating atmosphere there. Um, and also, you know, the weekender used to be fun. Uh, you could go into the city and, and enjoy yourself. Now you kind of have to watch your step. Um because there are some really good restaurants. So uh, I plan to hopefully get out there and, and get out the Tadich Grill, which is the oldest uh, restaurant in, in California for a good steak. Um, I, I also like the, the timing because as you were talking about, Greg, you know, you're, you're not going to get home too late from work, so to speak. Um, we'll talk about that with that 7.30 PM kickoff. Uh, but, you know, as far as the game itself, you know, USC will have the chance to, you know, work out, you know, whatever kinks they had against Rice. And this is their statement game. It's 4.30. It's prime time. It's on ABC. Uh, hopefully, you know, everybody across the country is watching. And this will be the time for, you know, USC to say, hey, revenge, revenge tour game number one. This team embarrassed us. Now we're going to embarrass them. And it'll be on national TV. Um I, there's not a whole lot of cons other than, you know, maybe, you know, there's still some growing pains and, you know, Stanford has that, you know, that physical style. Will USC be ready to play at least some of the game with that, you know, smashing the mouth type of mentality that Stanford brings to it. So we'll see. Well, one of the things we're going to see is this is a really important question out, uh, Chris, your thoughts on uh, the 430 Apollo, but I don't know what country you're going to be in. So I'm going to be, I'm going to be in America. Are you going to be in Istanbul? Are you going to be in, uh, Istanbul's Poland? not a country. Where are you going right? to be, Chris? Please tell us. Yeah. Istanbul's not a country. And no, I'm not going to be there. I'm going to be in this country for that one. 430 PM. I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to save my responses to all of them so we can go around. I'm not, I'm going to tell you this 430 is a great start time. I wish that was the start time every week. The other two later games, I hate the late start. I hate it if I'm there in person, and I hate it even more if I'm in Texas and the game starts at 9.30 p.m. Maybe the kickoff happens at 9.40. I have to stay up till 1 a.m. or so to finish it, which probably won't be a problem this year, but in the last couple of years, staying up till 1 a.m. so I can watch that abomination was just too much. That's all I have to say about these start times, Greg. All right. I, now, Kevin, how do you feel about that? In I love it. Of the I love it. It's a good, it's a great start time. And uh, you, you start in this in the sunlight, you end up in the fairly quickly going to lights. Um, and then uh, we'll just exercise a beat down of, uh, of Stanford. And I worry more about rice than I do Stanford. Well, there you go. Now, okay, you almost have uh, Arlitz choking on his, uh, on his tonsils there. Uh, Kevin, let me ask you a question. You played in the old Stanford stadium. Yeah. Not the new one. Did do you have you been to the new one, by the way? Have you? Have, I have, yeah. Uh, does that have any effect on the way the sun would come into that stadium from a bigger no, nah, not really. It's uh it's it's a north-south facing stadium, as I recall, for the most part, you know, whatever. What I do recall uh, in the um, the prior version was the field house and walking from the field house down to the field, which is I got a lot of stories on that one, but let's just suffice it to say is that we were given direct instructions on the field by Coach McKay that he didn't want to see one Stanford player left standing at the end of any play. All right, the old bowling pin theory. I want them all 10 down. All 10 uh, down. I will say that, uh, again, I look at it strictly from the standpoint of uh, what time the game will end. Uh, one of the things I will say uh, in terms that I have gone as a fan, uh, I do like the new Stanford Stadium. It's not so new anymore, but it's relatively new compared to the old one. Remind me of the kind of the Coliseum in a lot of ways. But I will say this, um, the going into San Francisco is always great. Driving down to Stanford, depending on the traffic, was not always wonderful, especially basically it's kind of like a two or three lane highway going from the freeway to Stanford. And one of the worst things about a night game, which, and I will say this is a con, 
is if you park your out your uh, car amongst the oak, oak trees and who knows the gullies that they have and everything else if it's not lit up good luck to you because you're going to need your own personal uh, uh navigator to find your car and who knows what you're gonna you know be gliding over when you're trying to get out of the parking lot so i always i always found that as a nuisance and even when i was riding they put the media almost where the where the regular par public parking is and uh the only good news uh, pros on that is since there's a lot of cars that are gone it's a little easier to locate your car but uh it can be a little uh wild there i remember going with bill plashke at the times we were both trying to find our car and uh, it was like playing where's waldo so uh with that let's move on to the, the third game and of course this is not a favorite of any of us i'm sure uh fresno state september 17th at 7 30 p.m pros and cons have at it mark yeah um it's fresno so it's the third game you know we had a listener question came in last week about player rotation i think we'll know by this game so um we can reflect back to that. You know, the only con, I guess, well, besides the start time, which by the time this game is over and done working and I get back home, it's probably going to be close to two in the morning. Um, and I'm still not done working. So, but, you know, there is a definite con. Heaven forbid USC lose at Stanford. This is the ultimate trap game. And Fresno travels well. So you will see a different type of red wave, red wave uh, come into the Coliseum. Other than that, this is just one of those, you know, go kick Fresno's butt. Hopefully people on the East Coast are still, the ones that aren't hung over or watching the game, it's a 7.30 kickoff. And there are, there are very few positives to, this, positives to this, unless you are a fan who just wants to OD on college football from when you wake up until you pass out. Well, then you're talking about Chris because that's what he does. He kind of uh, gets into it. Chris, what do you what do you think about the 7:30 kickoff? Do you like that? No, the only thing I'm going to say is it gives the Fresno State fans plenty of time to get very drunk, which they will be. That's my recollection of uh, previous Fresno State fan bases. That's all I have to say about that. Well, I will say this because I don't know what Chris is going to talk about in the upcoming. Uh, uh, musings with Arledge, but somehow I know before the season's over, at least by the time we get to Fresno, he'll probably have something to say about all the Bulldog fans. So I, uh, that's an anticipation, a personal anticipation. Don't try that. to, don't try to control my topics, Greg. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I just, I just throw them out there because um, in case I know it's impossible that you can't think of a topic, but I know it's out there somewhere as they Moody Blues would say, you're out there somewhere. Um, all right, Kev, what do you what do you think about 7:30 kickoffs? Did, um, we, did we didn't we have eight o'clock kickoffs at the McKay era? Did we have what time was that Oklahoma start back in uh, 73 in the Coliseum? The one with Joe Washington. That was a night game. Well, it, it ended up a night game. I don't think the kickoff was, I think, five or six o'clock. Was it? Okay. Yeah. I'm I guessing. Did. That's how I wrote. Yeah, I, I think I'm right on that. In that neighborhood, it had started off uh uh, you know, late afternoon. And of course it got, you know, lights came on fairly quick, but yeah, I'm positive that. Yeah. I'm so anyway, get out. I'm I, I, I hate seven thirty. So look, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Dallas based and you know, add, add up, you know, plus two time zone and, you know, boom, there it is. Uh, but like Chris said, um, spent the last several years, uh, you know, I, I guess Chris and I are probably the only two guys in the Dallas market that were watching USC football at one o'clock of the day in the morning, um, given the product that was put on the field. Well, just remember, guys, that uh, when you're in uh, in bed watching it and getting ready to go to sleep, Mark and I will be still in the Coliseum press box, yeah, slaving I, away. Yeah, that didn't help, but that's all right. Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> It won't will, be this painful this year, Kevin. I promise. Okay, I, I think that seven thirty games are ridiculous. That's my personal opinion. Wow. I, I read. I, I don't know who I read. I mean, a columnist that I kind of respect. I, I'm not going to name the name, but he said this is the perfect game, Fresno and USC. Seven thirty West Coast prime time. Well, I don't know if I buy into that. Uh, I this I do know. Uh, it'll be a sold out game. Uh, there's no way it can because last time Fresno played, we had I think 
uh, at least uh, I think it was 80,000 or something. So that would, uh, you know, under the new capacity. Um, I think it will be an intense game, but we're not really here to talk about the intensity of the game. I'm here to say, what do you think about the kickoff? So I, I, uh, I wish it wasn't 730. Uh, that's, I always dread that, you know, it's a mind game, but um, hopefully the weather is pleasant and we'll go on from there. So let's kind of jump to November, uh, Colorado, uh, Friday night, November 11th at 630 PM. Give me the pros and the cons, Mark. How do you like them apples for 6.30? Well, number one, it's better than 7.30. But, you know, if you're going to do 7.30, this would be the night to do it. It's on a Friday night. You're in L.A. There's traffic. Give the fans a chance to get to their seats. Um, you know, I guess a pro is there, they'll be the only game on TV. Um, I, I don't know. There, there, there's not a whole lot. I, I hate the weeknight games. So the, the, the fact that they're, you know, I guess it's later in the season is a pro. Hopefully, you know, USC is still undefeated or, you know, maybe with one loss. So because of that type of um, excitement, there's that rice, uh, that rice thing. I know that, that rice one might jump up. Again. <laughs> I, I'm not, no, no, don't hold me accountable because you guys keep returning to rice. I am not bringing that up, <laughs> but for some reason you incessantly, have a subconscious that brings it to the forefront. And I, I just, uh, I'm just, I, Chris I, is about ready to explode on the rice. We're, we're just all, coming. we're all, look we're at all, that green on we're, just, we're, we're so dang worried, man. <laughs> you know, just, I, I, I can't think about kickoff. Here, here it comes. I'm not sure, well, I'm not sure which is going to happen first. Right? I'm not race sure which will happen first. He's rolling one down the lane now. Here we go. No, no, no. Look, no. I was just I, surprised by your narcissism, Greg. Nobody mentioned you at all. He just talked about rice, and you immediately jumped to, right. oh, it's all about me and my rice obsession. It's not always all about you, Greg. Well, Come on. Chris, after you crucify me on a weekly basis, uh, the bottom line, how can I not feel that way? I'll just finish it up. It's another one of those Pac-12 after dark trap games, possibly. You know, which happens first, Greg? Does, does Rice beat USC or does Colorado break their 0 for, what is it, 15 slump against the Trojans? Uh, boy, that's a tough call, Mark. I got, I'm going to need weeks to figure that one out. So, you know. Yeah. 6.30 Friday night, who cares? Okay, Chris, do you care? It's stupid. Friday nights are for high school football. Thank and you. And anytime, anytime anybody tells me I have to be somewhere in L.A. at 6.30 on a Friday night, I'm unhappy. It's stupid. They should never do it. I thought Larry Scott was fired. Yeah, yeah. I was just going there. Like, why do we keep agreeing to this crap? I mean, I, I guess, you know, put up a good season this year, become the preeminent team that we should be, you know, you know drive up the ratings of the entire Pac-12, and then tell these guys that we're never playing on a damn Friday night ever again. See you later. It's it's part of the conference and Pac-12 contract. Uh, they're talking um, to the wrong. Look, they I, just get. get I'm not agreeing other, with it, Kevin. Get, I'm just get some other negotiators in because that's no. Sucks. You're right. No excuses. I agree. quit defending Larry Scott. I'm okay. it's right now. Clive Cop, Right now, Clive Cop's in charge. He can nix that. He can make an executive order right now. All right, we'll he, stop defending him. He, he did it with the conference championship game. I agree. He should do it with these weeknight games. All right, I'll conclude this segment this quarter. Uh, I think that uh, it's a ridiculous when you play on Friday night. Chris hit a nail right on the head. Uh, the high school games are on Friday night. The only thing that could have been worse is if it's a Thursday night. Well, away uh, game. Having, uh, way, you know, having to fight the traffic. I mean, I don't look at a game specifically that it starts on Thursday night at 6.30. It's like, what time do I have to get out of my house? To, to drive from Orange County where I live and drive the bumper to bumper freeway traffic to get in there. It's such a hassle. And then for a lot of people I know who are going to tailgate, they, some people tell me, well, I take the whole day off on Friday. So it gives me an excuse to go to Exposition Park and, 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 and enjoy myself. Uh, I go, well, more power to you. Uh, but I think uh, you also have to take about what time you get home at night, even if you're just a fan. I mean, a 7.30 game, uh, you know, 6.30 game, you're probably, you know, talking about midnight, depending how far away you live in the Los Angeles uh, area. So, yeah, I think uh, to me, uh, the right time is around five o'clock. Uh, if you're going to have a night game around that, I think it's a win-win for everybody. But uh, 
they keep on doing that. And of course, we still have games to be announced. Uh, I would assume Notre Dame will be at five o'clock. I assume that Utah will be a five o'clock or six o'clock local time there uh, nationally. So, you know, it does, the, the game times do have an effect. They do, they do create a situation where you have to uh, be alert of what's going on. All right, let's move on. Uh, we begin the second quarter with this question. Uh, salute to Troy, the preseason open to the public pub football dinner program. It's uh, the deal that introduces the football team coaches, recognizes great teams of the past and players from the past. It's going to be Saturday, June 18th on Cromwell Field. Normally, Salute to Troy is a week or two before the first game of the season. Uh, panel, your thoughts and whether you think it's a good idea that Salute to Troy is going to be held in mid-June as compared to late August. Uh, uh, how do you feel about that, Kevin? Does it make a difference? I mean, first of all, guys, let our audience know if you have been to Salute to Troy and uh, you, which would obviously have a bearing on what you think of, uh, you know, mid-June as compared to late August. So, Kev, go ahead. Give us your thoughts. Uh, I have been to Salute uh, to Troy, and I was also a guest speaker at the same event. So that was a pretty interesting and lovely experience. Um, and it was uh, during Pete Carroll's era. So it was, it was a, other than Sarkeesian, he probably couldn't remember it. It was a pretty memorable uh, event. So. Uh, that said, uh, I prefer it, you know, closer to the season starting than, you know, June. Um, it's, you know, look, um, it'll be good in, in June, too. So I'm sure that's fine uh, for the folks that, that attend. It'll be there. But it's it, when you have the team that's just coming at, through the uh, summer, uh, you know, fall camp or summer camp, I call it. It's always in the summer. Um, you got the players there. They're they're fired up they're you know ready to uh, they're thinking about starting to think think about uh, their, their opening game in this case it's rice um, and uh, you know it, it, you got you get a really good um, event going when it's that close to this to the uh, first game so that's my preference um, if it's in June then I'm sure that'll be a nice event as well Mark, I'm sure you've been to the Salute to Troy and can make a really good observation as well. Your thoughts on uh, having it on June 18th? I have, and I'm actually, you know, I'm not sure what they're, why they're doing it in June um, for a couple of reasons. One, th this might not be the team that they introduce, you know, in a few weeks will be the same team that's showing up when it's time to play Rice. Um, I anticipate a few more roster changes, more sub or subtraction than addition, but you understand my point. Um, I, I think they're doing it in June to kind of strike why the iron is hot. You know, this is more, I, I think they're gearing it more towards a recruiting NIL type of function now. Um, pass the hat around, you know, maybe a little Trojan tithing going on. Um, but, you know, it's a great event from as far as, you know, being able to meet everybody. Uh, it's usually catered by a really good barbecue. Um, the band is there again, you know, if you're into the collecting autographs and shaking hands with the players and all that, fantastic. Um, I would prefer it being closer to the start of the season. Um, I think they're doing it in June. And again, I don't know. And I'm, I'm just kind of being cynical. I think this is going to get a little bit weird and I'm not sure if I like, focusing so much on hey you're here to collect we're here to collect money i, I think that's why they're doing it now I, I can't think of another reason to do it during the summer chris i, I know you'll have a, a thought on uh, why you think they're doing it so what do you think i think there are three three good reasons to do it in in the middle of the summer like that number one is that's usually a boring time for college football fans because nothing is happening so now we at least have something to do uh, by the time you get within a week or two of the season, we're already talking about fall camp and uh, and we have we have something interesting. I don't think that's why they're doing it, but that's one of the reasons I like it. Second reason I like it is they're going to use it as a recruiting event. This is their big recruiting weekend. It's going to be very exciting. You're going to have a bunch of big time Trojans out there, including, I assume, a lot of former players. You're going to have a lot of excitement. It's great for the recruits. Uh, so I think it's a good idea. 
Uh, also, third reason, because it's at that time of the summer, you may actually be able to convince Steve Sarkeesian to fly out and be your keynote speaker. And I don't think you could do that if you were doing it, you know, at the end of uh, at the end of fall camp. So I think it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. All right, I will uh, check uh, Sarkeesian's schedule to see if he's able to come out here. If he maybe can combine a recruiting trip uh, to use it as a write-off. But um, had I known that was coming, I would have whipped out my Steve Sarkeesian fight on shirt that he's famous for. Thank you. Are you allowed to say that? I just did. I mean, I know you did, but... <laughs> it's on YouTube. There you go. And this Sorry, might be kids. the most mild... Our show might be one of the most mildest things on YouTube, Chris. Okay. I'm, look, kids, I'm sorry. I'm sorry he did it, but uh, what are you going to do? Well, I think it's shameful, personally. But, uh, <laughs> Wait, you're blaming, me? you're blaming me for quoting Steve you're Sarkeesian? Going in, you're going into the penalty box. You, you're going to have to watch UCLA football for 30 minutes next fall, uh, and that's going to be your punishment. I will say this. Uh, Chris took a lot of what I was going to say, which is, which is a good thing. The recruiting end of it is really important. The uh, June 18th is the Saturday night in the middle of this recruiting avalanche of talent. I think, they're, I think Lincoln Riley is looking at talent, 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 showing enthusiasm. Uh, June may not, as be, may not be as hot as it usually is in late August. And also, uh, depending on how the coach looks at it, he might find a uh, salute to Troy a week before the game or, or two weeks before the game as a distraction for his team. They'll be in the middle of, uh, you know, practicing and that sort of stuff. And maybe they'll have a scrimmage in the Coliseum on that Saturday. Uh, so maybe he, he sees it as, uh, you know, having in June is less of a distraction for his team. But my question is, is, is the whole team actually going to be there for that, for the salute to Troy? Uh, kind of uh, hitching my wagon to Mark a little bit. Uh, how about players that uh, go home for the summer or are not staying? I mean, there might not be very many of them, but it's just it's just a thought. So uh, uh, very very interesting the way we uh, take a look at uh, salute to Troy. But I think we'd all we'd all agree that the Pete Carroll years salute to Troy was just tremendous. It was just so much fun, so much electricity. As Mark said, all the barbecue chicken and ribs and, you know, you just pork out. You never knew sometimes who you were sitting with. My fear on this salute to Troy, how much are they going to charge the fans to come? Yeah, if they're looking to get a fan base back involved in using salute to Troy, they, they better not be charging $150 a, a, a person because I think that would defeat the purpose uh, of it. So hopefully they will not. In the past, it was in the past. It was what, like 60, 80 bucks more around there. But you hit the nail on the head. The past. When was the last time there was a salute to Troy? Two thousand nineteen, something like that. Well, like I said, I think they're doing this. They're doing it during the recruiting weekend, so I, I would anticipate a a higher per plate charge. Interesting, interesting. Well, well, we're gonna find out. Supposedly, there's more information coming through this week. So, uh, with that, let's go to halftime. Here's your question. Uh, kind of a dumb question, I'll admit, but an interesting one. Uh, uh, panelists, if the Trojans' white majestic mascot horse, whose name is Traveler, was going to have a change of name, what would you suggest that that name be changed to? Chris, what name would you give Traveler if Traveler was not going to be used as a name? I'm not going to answer that question, Greg, because why would we ever change Traveler's name? Let me give you some other questions that I'm not going to answer, just in case you're tempted. To so, <laughs> if we were to replace USC football with a different sport, what would that sport be? I'm not going to answer that. If we were to change the colors from Cardinal and Gold to a different set of colors, what colors would those be? I'm not going to answer that. If we were to bring back Clay Helton as head coach, how much would we pay him? I'm not going to answer that. All right. I'll answer almost everything else you ask, but not this one and not those. Well, that was very helpful, Chris. I'd like to thank you for it for, for on, as a team player that you, you admit it. As, you as admitted it was a dumb question. You, you know, I add on, I, you know, here's the thanks I get. I add on to your introduction that you're a graduate of the USC Law School, and this is the thanks I get. But that's okay. I've kind of grown to uh, to know what I'm dealing with, so I have to just take it with a grain of salt. But I'll tell you what, now, uh, Kevin, do you have a name that you would name the, the horse if his name wasn't Traveler? Yeah, Mr. Traveler. 
pissed her traveler. So you're, show, you're showing more respect. Now, I will ask you this question, Kevin. Does it, does it annoy you that the horse doesn't go around the football field? It now only goes down one side of the field? I will tell you, it bothers me. It bothers me. I don't like the fact that the horse doesn't encircle the Coliseum. I know how much that irritated Era Parsegian. He used to blow his mind every time Davis would return a kickoff, and then the horse would come by that part of the sideline. I wish he would go around the whole the whole Coliseum floor. That's just my opinion. What do you think? Well, that's my preference, but to put the track back in and let's do it. All right, so Mr. Traveler, uh, Mark, what do you think? What would you name the horse? I, I got nothing on this one, man. I, I literally... I. I sat around for an hour thinking, what would I name a horse? That's so obvious to me. I can't put, okay, here it comes. Go ahead. <laughs> I, just, here it I, comes. Was, I was stunned to hear that Culkin thinks about his answers for an hour. Like, <laughs> that was, I will say this, that was stunning. That was stunning. Did like, you have nothing you to guess. Like you do but to never think an hour what traveler's name should be changed? To. That's how much this one stumped me. What, how do you, what do you name a white horse? It's like a riddle. No, I will tell you what I would do. I would, in all seriousness, I would change Travelers to name, if it's going to be changed, to Conquest. I would change the horse's name to Conquest so that it would be in tune with the, the song uh, Conquest. It just made sense to me uh, on a serious side, but I know that I probably, that was probably a reach question, and I apologize to everyone that had to listen to all the answers, so... Uh, Go ahead and attack me on YouTube. It's okay. It just means that more people are watching the show. So with that in mind, uh, before we begin the second half, a reminder that you're watching or listening to WeRSC.com's Inside the Trojan Tuttle. This week's WeRSC panelists include Mark Culkin, Chris Arledge, Kevin Bruce, and I'm Greg Katz. We encourage you to check out WeRSC.com's part, which is part of the On3 network, and become a subscriber to the best coverage of USC football and Trojans athletics. And as a bonus, WeRSC is currently offering a WeRSC seven-day free trial, which includes monthly or yearly payment options uh, to our exclusive On3 Plus content that includes breaking stories, analysis, and data for USC football, basketball, and the balance of USC athletics. So with that in mind, bell again. We kick off the second half and the third quarter with this. This is an interesting question, actually. Uh, Will Lincoln Riley and his staff be able to again bring in a recruiting class that rises to the level of a Pat Hayden, Richard Wood, Anthony Davis, and J.K. McClass in 1971, and Anthony Munoz and Brad Buddy pairing in 1976, Ronnie Lott, Dennis Smith combo of 1977, a Sean Cody, Matt Gutigood duo in 2001, or if you want to go even a little bit after that, a Reggie Bush and Lendale White 2003. Um, or even a Ray Maluga and Brian Cushing uh, pairing in 2005. Does this class, from what you can see, Mark Culkin, is it going to approach one of the all-time classes the way it's going right now? Uh, well, each of those classes that you mentioned went on to win a national championship eventually, right? Did I did I catch on to your? That's probably accurate. Okay, so um, you know I'm looking at on threes. 2023 recruiting class rankings as it stands right now. Um, USC ranks number one in the conference, number two nationally. So I, I would say they're trending in the right direction. They've got their five-star quarterback. They've surrounded him with four and five-star receivers. So, um, you know, they're not going the running back route, so to speak. They're kind of taking that quarterback wide receiver direction um, yes is the answer in the short, you know, we'll find out if these guys are as good as all those other guys you, you mentioned and will USC win a national championship within a year or two after they arrive. It's, it's, I would say yes, based on the, you know, the trend. Chris, is this recruiting class on its way to being one of the all time great recruiting classes? That is, we're talking about the class of 2023. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, he's going to have a – Lincoln Riley is going to have a very good recruiting class. He's going to get a lot of the guys he wants, and it's going to be very highly ranked. Um, you can't judge these things ahead of time. I know, we're, I, I know we're just having fun with it. But, 
you know, you had all these uh, great duos you mentioned. I mean, a few years ago, we had a linebacker class that uh, involved EA and Solo. You can make an argument those are maybe the two top linebackers in the country. And to this point, neither one of them has actually done anything for USC on the football field. It's just hard to know. I am excited about the class. I'm excited about uh, – uh, and, and I'm excited about the running backs too. I mean, both of those running backs are top ten – recruits according to some services zachariah branch i think is going to be unbelievable um so i'm excited about the class how good they'll be i don't know they're gonna be good enough to win a lot of games whether they'll be good enough to win a national title or not i'd like to say yes so you know what i guess nothing's stopping me i'll say yes okay kevin you have the unique position that um did you come in after that 71 recruiting class or before it came in 72 okay so you have some real strong familiarity with that particular class yeah from what you see in your experience having been at sc in terms of the classes you saw and the ones you know that followed after you and so on and so forth could this recruiting class rank up there with some of the greatest of all time there's a lot to prove and um I know we're talking on paper here, but yeah, um, well, where, 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 my, where my brain is going, um, I was gonna make a joke if I want, uh, where my brain was going, and it's really about the uh, offensive scheme and the defensive scheme, both of which are new, uh, let alone the players and the coaches. You got, a lot of, you, you got a lot of new, 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 new going on here. And you can have some great recruiting classes, but you got, you're going to have to, you know, bake these guys in, get them up to speed, uh, get them, in, you know, believing in themselves. Uh, they're going to have to pull out some close uh, uh, victories uh, and, and, and show that type of depth. Uh, and, um, you know, which is certainly doable. Um, and the class certainly has on paper as of right now looks pretty darn good that's impressive it's impressive i'd sure rather have our class or anybody else's class that i can see so far um so you know that's that's the good side of it the um uh, you know is it, it is can it be as good as the others well look i'll go with chris sure yeah it can but let's go see how it turns out right okay i will conclude this segment by saying it's on its way to being one of the great classes, no question about it in my mind. However, uh, disclaimer, until they prove they can bring offense and defensive linemen in on that class, uh, I don't care how many skilled players they bring in, I don't care how many five stars they bring in, it's still going to get down, especially as we enter a larger version of the playoffs in the future. You know, uh, I was talking with somebody and I said, okay, I'll give you, a, I'll give you a, 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 an option here. Would you rather see USC next year win the Pac-12, go to the Rose Bowl and get a victory, or would you like to see USC win the Pac-12, go to the playoffs and get blown out in the semifinal round? What would be the better choice? And, uh, you know, it, it makes you stop and think a little bit about, you know, in a big picture, if they don't have the linemen when they enter the, uh, the playoffs, uh, it, it could be really detrimental to the progress that they made up to that point, in my opinion. So I would like to see this class get some linemen. I know that they're recruiting the right players. I know the right players who never would have come onto this campus under the previous regime. I mean, they're coming. Uh, but they have to get something to kickstart it with maybe two or three names uh, to get the ball rolling. And I hope that they can uh, finally do that. So uh, it's going to be interesting. That's, that's for sure. All right. So we kind of concluded with that. And you know what that means, what many of you have been waiting to do, or you have speeded up your, your, your counter to the point of it's time for, you know what, now a quick story uh, before we uh, light it up. And you know what I mean by light it up. Uh, during the week, I was cleaning my table, and I don't know why. I think it was part of a master plan by the football gods. But I, I knocked the Coliseum Chris Arledge torch. It fell onto my uh, floor, which is hard. 
and broke off into a, a gazillion pieces. And I said, oh my goodness, this can't be happening. And uh, you know, trying to sweep it all off of the floor was ridiculous. It was a pain. And I said, maybe Arledge is getting back at me for something. But uh, thank goodness, these came in in a package of two. So I actually had, this is the son of the son, of the father, of the Arledge um, uh, candle. And uh, we are going to light it up now to begin the fourth quarter. Again, we don't have the band to play uh, the William Tell Overture, but we do have the candle here. Thank goodness uh, for that. It's become a tradition that many fans have commented on that they kind of think it's kind of cute, call it whatever you wish. But with that in mind, it is now time to turn our attention to the one, the only, Chris Arledge. What do you got for us today, Chris? Well, Greg, I'm, I'm thrilled that we had that backup candle available to us and, and also thrilled that we got to hear the story behind it. Absolutely. Uh, Thank you. Listen, Jordan Addison stunned the college football world when he decided to move schools, to go somewhere that has a top three quarterback, arguably the best offensive coach in the country, and where he'll be surrounded by enough talent that it'll make it hard for teams to double team him. And he chose that instead of going back to Pitt, a place where he had lost his quarterback, lost his wide receivers coach, and lost his offensive coordinator. And yet all of the world loses its mind. Why he would do this is one of the great mysteries, maybe one that will be unsolved forever. But most educated, uh, educated observers suspect there must be really something really sinister afoot and probably something illegal. Pittsburgh talk show host Andrew Filipponi recently offered the deep insight that maybe Jordan Addison wanted to get paid to play this very dangerous game, the way so many of his peers are now getting paid to play it, and the way Filipponi himself, for some reason, also gets paid merely to talk about it. The thought that he might get that sort of payment made Filipponi very angry. So Filipponi, who nobody outside of Pittsburgh had ever heard of before last week, launched a humdinger of an unhinged tyrant, mm -hmm. placed him directly in the internet spotlight. And you know what? I liked it because I am a man who appreciates a good tyrant. Now, Filipponi, after saying all the things that all of the other unoriginal talking heads have said, then let his inner, his inner Wyatt Earp free on USC football. Let him know that he's coming and hell's coming with him. Here are a few highlights. I hope USC loses every game this year. I want them to lose every game in perpetuity. I want them to get the death penalty. <laughs> <laughs> I want them to blow up the LA Coliseum. I want them to disband their college football program. Well, oh, now, now, I'll admit, I'm a little bit surprised that a Syracuse grad could get that emotionally invested in the future of Pitt Panthers football. I'm a little bit surprised anybody could, to be honest with you. <laughs> but a couple of things, Filipponi. First, you're a bit late. The NCAA already tried to disband USC's football program. Then USC tried even harder. We literally fought, we literally hired Forrest Gump's cousin to be our head coach for six years. What more could we have done to try to disband our program than that? As for the Coliseum, I don't think they're going to knock it down. Now, we did hire a notorious drunk to redesign it. And for some reason, like a child playing with Legos, he stacked everything up just on one side. So it now looks like it may capsize at any minute. <laughs> I'm informed by USC's architects and structural engineers that it will not. So I don't think the Coliseum will be destroyed. I think it will remain standing. So I guess what I'm saying, Filipponi, is we sort of tried your plants already and they didn't work. I'm sorry to say that I don't think USC will lose every game in perpetuity. In fact, I think they're going to win a bunch of them. But Filipponi was only getting started. And let's give him credit. This is somebody who isn't afraid to admit what he really believes, that violence really is the answer. Listen to what he had to say. If I saw Lincoln Riley, I would pick him up over my head and slam his ass because I could probably beat up Lincoln Riley, one of the few people in major collegiate sports that I feel comfortable if I saw the guy in a dark alley, I could beat the snot out of him. Now, let me say, Mr. Filipponi, that I respect your courage. Threatening to beat somebody up over the internet when that person is 2,500 miles away and will never be in the same room as you does take a tremendous amount of courage. That's William Wallace-level stuff there. Now, 
I don't know what would happen if Riley and Filipponi actually met in a dark alley. I don't even know why Andrew Filipponi spends so much time in dark alleys. But I'm sure he and his friends are simply trying to live their best lives, and who am I to judge? But because Lincoln Riley doesn't spend a ton of time in the alleys of Pittsburgh's red light district, I don't think you're going to run into him, Filipponi. Your dreams of suplexing Lincoln Riley behind an adult bookstore in the presence of two meth addicts is probably a long shot. That being understand, I, I now understand where Filipponi is coming from. Pitt claims nine national titles, including one after the face mask was invented. It's a home of Tony Dorsett, Dan Marino, Larry Fitzgerald, Aaron Donald, and Fred Rogers, who probably thinks that Filipponi isn't much of a neighbor. Pitt was once coached by Pop Warner, and no, his teams at Pitt were not full of little kids, even if Pitt football sometimes looks that way. But despite that rich history, Pitt is apparently now such an irrelevant program that it can't scrape together enough money to pay the only star on its team. I mean, USC has to pay Caleb Williams and some other guys, too. Jordan Williams, Jordan Addison was the only guy that Pitt had to play. The Pittsburgh metropolitan area has 2.3 million people. You guys couldn't pass the hat around the local TGI Fridays and scrape together a little bit to pay your only guy? I was embarrassed at first. Then I saw the late night commercial with Sally Struthers, who was trying to raise money for Pitt football, and I got it. I was sad. I saw the hovels that Pitt football players have to live in. I don't want Pitt football players to continue to live like Oliver Twist. Please, sir, I want some more. I, too, fight back tears when I see Pitt, uh, pictures of Pitt's athletic facility, which is largely made of cardboard boxes and scrap aluminum siding. I saw Pitt's weight room, which isn't really a weight room at all. It's just a bunch of guys breaking rocks while Inspector Javert screams at them. <laughs> Even worse, Pitt isn't Oregon. The players at Pitt probably have to pay for their own weed. And I bet some of them don't even have the money to do it. So what are they going to do? They can't auction away their players' tickets the way Kevin Bruce used to because nobody wants to watch their team play. So Pitt players do the only thing they know how to do. They send out Nigerian Prince emails and they start underwhelming OnlyFans accounts. Narduzzi used to work on the docks. Union's been on strike. He's down on his luck. It's tough. So tough. But don't feel sorry for Pat Narduzzi. He may now make less money than Jordan Addison, but he's doing the best he can to get his program on track. He bolstered Pitt's recruiting efforts by advertising to the entire world that no matter how wildly <laughs> successful you are at Pitt, you will never, ever receive fair market value. And let's be honest, how many of us have ever seen an ad on Monster that says worst compensation in the industry and didn't say to ourselves, I need to check out that place. <laughs> then he sent a series of drunk late night voicemail messages to Lincoln Riley, like an emotionally devastated spurned lover. And we know those almost always seem to help the situation. Like I said, he's got this. But like Philipp like Philipponi, I hate to see people in need and do nothing. So here's what I'm willing to do. Like Jennifer Lawrence, I volunteer. I volunteer as tribute. I will take Lincoln Riley's place. I will represent the USC football program. I will fly to Pittsburgh and I will fight Andrew Filipponi. Not out of anger. I'm not <laughs> angry with Andrew Filipponi. I'm actually moved by his largely inarticulate efforts to help. I'm touched that the guy sees Pitt football suffering, says he needs to do something about it, and immediately jumps to physical violence. If the man cares that much, I want to help. So I will fight him, but only for charity. Not in a dark alley. We're going to fight where the whole world can see, and we can properly solicit donations. And I will offer one of my own. Filipponi can pick the rules. He can choose Brazilian jiu-jitsu or some other submission grappling rules, which would be nice for me. Or boxing, MMA, Hunger Games, Kumite, Mad Max, Thunderdome rules, whatever he wants, whatever makes him feel most comfortable because it's for a good cause. And if he beats me, I will donate $5,000 to Kickstart, a new collective for pit football, so that the Pitt Panthers can at least give their players a couple of bowls of porridge. So, Andrew Filipponi, if you can hear me, let's do this. We can't fix everything that's wrong with the world, but we can at least fix this. Let's do our part. Let's fight for pit football. 
Well, there you have it. And I just would like to make this disclaimer. All comments and opinions are those of Chris Arliss. Do not represent WeRSC.com. But we know one thing. If you wonder why Chris was able to so eloquently put things in perspective with uh, Filipponi, I would invite you to check out uh, Sunday's um, uh, IMHO Sunday column that I wrote in which I actually put on the tape of uh, Filipponi having the, the uh, absolute tirade that he did. I think if you have a chance to go and, and, and listen to it, uh, it'll even more enhance your pleasure of uh, Chris's uh, dissertation. So uh, you might want to check that out. Now, what we do want to check out is the fourth quarter. Here we go. Uh, this is kind of an open-ended question panel. So what major announcement, either on or off the field, would you like to see take uh, place come to fruition? Kevin, what do you want to, what big story do you want to see next coming out of USC for football? Yeah, headline is um, Heisman Trophy uh, moved back to its rightful spot at USC. All righty. Uh, how do you feel about that one? Uh, Mark, what is the big headline you want to see? Yeah, Echo. I'll just say Reggie Bush is the name that Kevin omitted. Okay. Uh, Chris Arledge, your thoughts? Uh, my big announcement, uh, the NCAA is immediately disbanded. College football will be formed into four major conferences of 16 teams each. Of two divisions of eight teams each, the division winners play each other for the conference title. The four con the four conference <laughs> championships uh, champions play for the uh, the national title in a four team playoff. That's the first announcement I want. The second announcement I want is that Charlie Weiss is the new head football coach in the University of Notre Dame. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a possibility. You just never know. Uh, I will say the the. Uh, Announcement that I would like to see, uh, uh, the next announcement is uh, at least one, preferably three, five-star offensive linemen uh, announced that they're coming to USC. Uh, I, I am just absolutely uh, focused on getting uh, offensive line recruits in there at, at the high level quality. I'll even go with a four-star if we can't get a five-star, but I, I would like to see that major announcement coming forth. And uh, Hopefully, uh, it'll become sooner rather than later. Uh, as far as the Bush comment, I think I'll reserve that one to one of our questions coming up. Let's go to overtime panel. We're in overtime. It's time to answer some viewer questions. Panel answers in a free-for-all uh, answer format. If uh, you listeners or viewers like to submit a question that we can answer or give you our opinion, just go to either the Gary P. or We RSC members message board at wersc.com. From there, you'll see the topic thread regarding questions for Inside the Trojan Huddle. Okay, question one from SC, the one in the OC. I assume that's Orange County. I think it's almost a rhetorical question. It will be a short answer. What is the plan for the QB3 this season? Will Mo Hassan be ready to go? Will we bring in a transfer or will we roll with our walk-on QBs? And panel, what would be your first offensive play call to open the season? Which player scores SC's first uh, offensive points and first defensive points of the season? All right. Anybody uh, want to jump in on this uh, first one? And let me just say this. I think we all know that the uh, that question, the beginning of it has already been answered uh, with Jensen uh, announcing he's coming to USC uh, from Contra Costa. So if you want to skip past that one, uh, unless you have something to add, uh, let's go on to... Uh, who do you think is going to be uh, – what do you think the first offensive play call is going to be? And uh, which uh, score? Who, which player is going to score SC's first offensive points? And which player is going to score the first defensive points? So uh, go ahead, guys. Go for it. First yeah, offensive know. points would be uh, Williams um, at, receiver, at receiver in a corner route. Okay, Mario Williams on a Z corner, right? right. Okay, so uh, that's the offensive one. Kevin, did you want to stay on a uh, point here with defensive? You know, that's just a question of, uh, look, it'll be uh, most likely a nickelback, so. Okay. Yeah. Thing. And uh, pick did, you have a, did you have a feeling on, let's say, the first uh, offensive play, what it's going to be? Yeah, I like the uh, – uh, uh, 
their cut point, their misdirection cut point. Okay, kind of their counter, their counter uh, yeah, trade. The counter yeah. trade. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay, guys, who else wants to jump in on that? Yeah, I'll go running play. Um, not going to get specific on the actual call because I, I don't, I don't know their play calls. Um, I think Caleb Williams will score the first points on offense on some sort of you know quarterback keeper on an option, and Kalen Bullock will return the an interception for first defensive points. Okay, Chris, you care to throw your hat in the ring on this one? I think I'd quick kick because after reading your analysis of Rice's defense, I think we need to be very conservative and play a field position game with them. Hey, by the way, Greg, you gave a disclaimer. You gave a disclaimer for my little tirade a minute ago. Do you do that every week or is this, or were you so frightened by this particular tirade that you thought a disclaimer was in order? Well, you know what? It's, it's been kind of leading towards that, Chris, week after <laughs> week. You, you, there, you've hit a point now where I, although it's greatly appreciated, it's, it's tremendous. I, there's nothing negative I have. I just felt that maybe we just needed a little separation there to make sure we're all not being sued uh, by a Filipino or Philip, what's his name? Filiberti? Uh, what's oh, it, what's by a Filipino? Name? I've never said anything bad about the people of the Philippines. Okay, we're and, not going there. We're, we're not going there. Where? By the way, are we going to start? Are we going to start giving disclaimers because Mark Culkin's around here dropping f bombs? Thank you. You know, I almost forgot that. It was good that you brought that up. Uh, you know, we we we'll have to expand on that in a future broadcast. We Look, have, I, I, need, one, I need a mute button, and I think that's what I'm going to ask Eric McKenney. Can I get? A mute I was button? literally quoting a former USC coach. Oh, that was. was a good one, Mark. That was really that was really good. Are you taking lessons from Chris? No, I, no, no. Uh, okay. I will just say on this particular question, I think that it'll be a play action pass, the first play offensive play, because everyone would expect that SC is going to show their, their running game. I think it'll be a play action pass. It'll be a crossing route to a tight end. How's that? I think that'll be the first one. Uh, I also think that the uh, first score will be, I agree. I think it will be Mario Williams on a corner uh, pattern. And I think the first uh, touchdown will be a, a pick six uh, by uh, the, the transfer from Colorado. I will say that. I think that he will, he will jump it and he will score on it. And that will be the beginning uh, of the end of Rice. All right, let's go to question two. Uh, I'm not sure on this one. Mark probably will know. Uh, if you can, please include a recap uh, on those uh, – that are out for medical reasons, including availability for fall camp and the upcoming season. Uh, anybody have some knowledge on that? You know, it, it's hard to keep track of this stuff because they, they were really, with the injuries, they kept things really close to the vest. Uh, I know um, Britton Allen has been 100% cleared, so he'll be out there now for fall camp. He made that announcement just a couple of days ago. He did that on social media, didn't he, Mark? Did he yeah. That on so yeah. USC has another safety body yeah, yeah. that they'll be able to work with. Uh, possibly um bobby haskins you know the offensive tackle transfer from from virginia i don't know if he is 100 percent ready but towards the end of spring camp he was starting to get physical you know with the tackling dummies and so forth so i anticipate him being ready to uh you know add some depth to the offensive line uh, offensive line room other than that um you know damani jackson uh, I, I think we talked about him previously on another show. Uh, they're probably going to look to redshirt him if they can't get his, you know, off-season injury straight. Um, on that, I that's uh, let's let's come back to that question. Uh, start a fall camp. It, right now, we're in that you know black hole area where we're we're just not getting a whole lot of information. So uh, I apologize. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right, let's move on. Uh, to question number three, the uh, hot button question. This is from Cyrus uh, from Redondo Beach. Beautiful Redondo Beach. Love going down to the pier there. How many Treisman Trophy winners does USC have? Greg, you want to handle this one? Uh, I'll be I happy. Think to maybe, okay, here I, we go. I think maybe this was directed to you, Greg. So go ahead. Fire away. This will be fun. Okay. I will just hold my ground. I believe that they have six Heisman Trophy winners. The school says they have six Heisman Trophy winners. 
when they finally say they've got seven, I will still probably not uh, agree with it, but I will support the decision that if they say they want seven, it looks a lot better than six when you're going to recruit. Uh, so I am going to say till the school makes a choice that says they have seven, I'll say they have six. And um, that's all I'll say on the matter for the moment. Don't worry, Greg, that's not warm rain coming down your back. Now, what does that mean? Is not, is, what, what, never okay. mind. Okay, I think I, now that he said never mind, I think I understand what that means. Uh, we can debate this from, from here to eternity, uh, but uh, does anyone want to add to this before we move on? They have seven Heisman Trophy winners, Greg. The school doesn't even <laughs> recognize it, Mark. Okay. What is it you don't understand? The school doesn't even recognize that they have a seven. Right, and 55, to, 55, to 19 never, 55 to 19 never happened either, Greg. Oh, my gosh. You can't, uh, you can't imagine something didn't happen because you don't agree with it. No, no, he was ineligible. He was ineligible. Was he not, did he follow the rules, yes or no? Yes or no? Don't tell me maybe. You can't be a little bit pregnant. Yes or no? Did his parents follow the rules? I'm no. not asking that question. I'm saying, did he break the rules? Yes or no? Sure. Okay. Would you like to be have been Fresno State on the night that he established that tremendous? I'm not playing this game, Greg. He won the Heisman. I'm sorry, Chris. That's two in one show. I'm not going to play this game that you can't imagine something didn't happen because it fits if you your. You were narrative. coaching against him, and you knew he was ineligible. Greg, he won the Heisman. No, that's uh, you're, you're just. And no like, matter how many cars he was driving, no matter how many free, me. no matter how many free trips his parents got to Berkeley. Or on road trips. Wait a minute. You think it it's doesn't all his affect fault? what he did on Is it all his parents' fault? I'm sorry. Is it all his parents' fault? Pretty much. And you know oh, that. Pretty Greg. much doesn't mean 100 percent But he you know better, has you know he ever apologized for it? Greg, let's not play this game. You know has what they nailed. Ever apologized Greg, you know what they nailed him Has on. he ever apologized for it? Cares. His... Oh, I don't care. Apparently not. No, I don't. I'm telling you straight up. I his apology you. isn't going to change believe. anything. Well, that's why he's got six Heisman trophies. Oh, stop it. Stop. By... Stop. All right. Now, you know, the only positive about this is you, we've all made Chris happy. Look how I haven't seen him this happy since what? Because you're digging your heels on Greg. Up. You're digging your heels on Greg, something that you know eventually is going to be over, overturned again. It, it may be overturned, but. So I, you're going to look I, like I, a hypocrite. I'm just. I, I'm, just I'm just. You'll, happy you'll, acknowledge, I... you'll, you'll acknowledge seven when USC says it's okay, but you won't. <laughs> Your common sense acknowledges. I don't. I, I say if you have rules, you don't make rules. You're Meshugana. You That's my opinion. You're Meshugana. Okay, I'll take that as a compliment. It is. All right, let's move on to the next question because I don't think it's going to be settled here at this moment. Uh, this is from Trojan seventy seven. What are your thoughts on uh, CLR coach uh, Lincoln Riley installing an occasional? Student body left, student body right call in the offense this season. I've been a Trojan fan and supporter since I was eight years old, 1958. And to me and my Trojan buddies, that would be in the spirit of keeping an important piece of USC football tradition. I think the fans would get a kick out of it. And I think uh, Coach Riley and the Trojans can pull it off. P.S. I never miss a show. First of all, thank you for not missing a show. I will chime in on this. I think it should be in the contract that you want that you run one student body right or left just one time at least during the season line up in an eye formation with a fullback in an eye slot and sweep right or left you only have to do it one time so if you want to do it against rice and get it out of the way fine but i think it would be a wonderful tradition that's just my opinion anybody else want to chime in oh i wouldn't jump on which formation is being used uh, yeah, that's that's not as material unless it's if it's just totally a tradition thing, then yeah, I guess so. Um, I don't see the point of that. Quite honestly, you're out there trying to win a football game, and uh, you're you know moving a tradition play that's uh, you know we're we're not going to run it again. Um, it doesn't make sense to me. What what does make sense is you should run a student body uh, or a sweet play, you know. Um, and they, actually, they will, and they'll pull a guard and a and a and, uh, and a center. Frankly, is how uh, I see them running it. And 
and they may pull the uh, an off tackle as well. So, uh, okay. To me, that, to me, that's just, that's a student body as much as anything else. I don't care about the I program, frankly. They did it in the spring. Yeah. Okay, uh, Chris, did you have anything you want to add to this? No, I, I, I'm, I'm with Kevin in that. I, I think you're going to see outside running plays with pulling guards and maybe an H-back instead of a fullback. Uh, and I can live with that. I, I don't, um, if Lincoln Riley wants to spend time practicing that one play so he can make um, the dinosaurs happy, I'm in favor of that. But uh, I don't think he's going to want to spend a lot of time working on that. He's going to want to win a football game. Okay, which kind of brings us to uh, the final question. Uh, I think it's a kind of a nice way to end up this uh, particular session. It's from O3 Burrito. Can someone on the panel talk about a favorite experience tailgating at USC? Now, I will, I'm going to exit out of this question myself. Uh, I don't go tailgating, so uh, I don't have that much experience in it. I'm, if I go to a tailgate, I've had friends that constantly say, you got to come to our tailgate, but I'm I'm so focused in on the game and getting up in the press box and, and, and getting my head around uh, what I have to do up there that I, I can't sit there. I, I'll always be looking at the clock. Uh, okay. I want to be in the press box at least two hours before the game. So it kind of distracts from me, but I know that you guys have uh, tailgated and you probably have a lot of great uh, memories of it. So go ahead, go for it. Um, go ahead, Chris. You want to start? No, but actually, my favorite USC tailgating story wasn't at the Coliseum. It was at Notre Dame. And um, I went to Era Parsegan's uh, tailgate party, and I talked to him for about 15 or 20 minutes. And then we went out and watched uh, Reggie Bush put Matt Leinart over the end zone to win that game. That was a good day. A good day. Yeah, mine was probably at the Coliseum. I think it was 2005. It was the USC CLA game. This is when tailgating was at its peak. I mean, you had cars lined up on Vermont, back around MLK, back onto Figueroa the night before for hours, waiting to get in the parking lot so they can get to their prime tailgating spot. Our prime tailgating spot was right there outside gate 19 where the, the bookstore sits now, and it's all black iron fenced off. We were under trees on the grass, it was beautiful. Anyways, um, we spent hours parking a line only for a, a few UCLA fans to show up to the spot. And they started putting down this wood dance floor. And we're like, what are you doing? I said, oh, well, we reserved the spot. And we're like, no, you didn't. This is our spot. It's been this, our spot for the last 10 plus years. Go away. Well, they kept building this dance floor. Well, it got to a point where they didn't show us the permit. And they literally had their female guests as their, you know, architects putting the stuff down. We weren't going to put up with this anymore. And our, our group was starting to show up and unload. We started taking the floor and putting it where it belonged, which is on Bill Robertson Lane. So um, we made sure you see, I understood the Coliseum is for USC fans. There's no such thing as a permit. Um, that you can use on the Coliseum for tailgating and we'll fight over it if we have to. It, it, they're a sacred ground, so we weren't gonna give it up to, to UCLA. And they wanted to have a dance party, literally. <laughs> they had a DJ and they were putting down those wood pot, those, one by one, those wood things that turned into a floor. It was crazy. Kevin, do you have any, uh, I know that you were playing a lot of the time, of course, but in your, senior years so we say mm. do you have any uh, tailgate experiences that uh, or one that comes up ironically like chris mine's at uh, notre dame but not on the not on the field it was on campus uh my senior year uh my wife it was my fiance at the time picked me up and a bunch of guys and uh, we had two they had two cars a girlfriend of hers had a rental had, a, had a, another rental car as well anyway they took about 10 or 12 of us over. The tires were, you know, riding on the rims. Took us over to the uh, Notre Dame campus and we went to the um, um, bonfire rally and had a blast. Um, you know, we had our little USC blazers on and 
and uh, we had to take, take some pictures and uh, gosh, I wish I could find some of those pictures. But anyway, uh, we took some pictures and people were uh, uh, looking at us kind of weird. A couple guys kind of identified us as players and uh, no, no one said anything you know, st overly stupid. It was, it was actually fairly uh, genteel in that respect. I do remember uh, the head coach, and it was divine then because Parsegian couldn't make it past that prior year. <laughs> Another story. Um, and divine was screaming and yelling and spitting, and I wouldn't touch that microphone, yuck. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was great. And then we went out and, and we beat uh, Joe Montana and the rest of the Fighting Irish the next day. So it was a, it was a good it was a good visit. It was a great visit, actually. Very good, very good. Well, fans, a reminder again, if you have a question or comments for our panel, go either uh, to the WeRC message boards, um, the Gary P or the members only board. Uh, look look there, you'll see it for uh, being able to ask a question for, uh, for our, our great panel. And with that, it's a wrap for this edition of Inside the Trojans Huddle. Big thank you to this week's panel of Mark Culkin, Chris Arledge, Kevin Bruce, great job, guys. And a special thank you to all of you for watching or listening to Inside the Trojan Subtle. Till next Tuesday, this is your host, Greg Katz, reminding you all to fight on, everybody.